A very good evening to you all. It's good to see you all and thank you for being here. You can see that the title for this evening is The Writings. And this is all under the series of Getting to Know the Bible. And uh, you probably all know Tom. Tom's going to be speaking to us on that subject in a little while. What we'll do is we'll start with a hymn and then we will have a reading. The reading is going to be from 2 Timothy 3. And then we will have a prayer before we listen to Tom on that subject. So the hymn is 180. The first verse reads, O God, who didst thy will unfold in wondrous modes to saints of old, by dream, by oracle, by seer, wilt thou not still thy people hear? Hymn 180. So we're going to take a reading to introduce the um, subject this, this evening from 2 Timothy 3. Uh, Lawrence from Mumbles is going to read that for us. And if you have this uh, burgundy coloured Bible, it's on page 1707. 2 Timothy chapter 3, page 1707. Timothy 2, verse, chapter 3, 1 to 3 to 17. But knowing this, that in this the last days precious times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, love of money, process, profit, plus this disobedient to parents, and till sunk. Thankful and unholy, unliving, unforgetting slanders without self control, burying the dispersion of good, transit to headstrong, headstrong naughty lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of guiltiness and denying his power, and from such people turn away from, from away for, for this sort are those who creep into houses our house, and make captives of the guilty women 
loaded down with sin, led away by victorious lusts, also learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. No, Tom. Then, then as Jonas and Jebus restored Moses, so, so do these who will arrest the truth of men, corrupting minds, disproving and concerning the faith, but they would pro pro possess no further, for they have found will be manifest to hold us as also your dears also. But you have carefully followed by doctoring manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance, pre pre presented afflictions happened to me in Hanticon in Hanticon Nook at the in Nakomium and Liston and Bethesda and Indua and out of all the land of deliverance, me. Yes, all, all who desire, desire to have the godly, godly in Christ will suffer persecution, but even men and impostors will grow worse. Was deceiving and being deceitful, but but you must continue in the things of which you have learned and be assured of knowing from whom you have learned them, and from the Lord you have known the holy scriptures, which is able to make you wise and salvation through the faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scriptures is given by inspiration of God and the profitable of doctrine, the reproof of kerning, congregation and inspiration in the righteousness that, that the men of God may be complete through equipped for, for, their, for, for every good works. I I met Jeremy and all the all the judges that was there on Friday night. The the judges have done a very very good work on on our talent show on Friday night. I like to thank them all very much. Uh, thanks, Lawrence. We can have words about that on the way home. <laughs> Lawrence, we can't take you anywhere, can we? <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the reading. So, uh, before we listen to Tom, uh, let's stand and say a prayer to God. Almighty God, we come before you this evening and thank you that we're able to come to this place, that we're able in this country to open up your word and do so freely and that we're able to learn from it. We've just read that you have inspired those people who have recorded the Bible and that this is indeed your word and that it should be profitable for us, that it is appropriate for us to learn it, to act upon it. It is even there for salvation so that we might be your children, that we might be men and women of your name. So as we consider these things this evening, as we consider your word, the writings, help us to have an open mind and to think about how we apply ourselves to the things that you have caused to be written for us to learn and to act upon. We thank you that we have this time. We pray for your blessing as we now consider these things together. Please hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. So, we're going to hand over to Tom.
hear about the writings. Okay, okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for coming along. So, we're going to be continuing a series, um, which you may or may not have been to the others, but basically looking at uh, different books of the Bible, um, and, and we've called them the writings, and we sort of chop it up in, into different sections each time we look at this. And tonight, um, if you can read them along the bottom there, we, we've got quite a, quite a section to look at. Um, some of these you may have heard of, some of them you may not have. We're going to be looking at uh, Ruth and at Esther. We're going to be looking at Job, at Psalms, at Proverbs, at Ecclesiastes, and at Song of Solomon. So I hope you've brought your popcorn and your sleeping bags. Um, we won't be going into all of them in massive detail. Don't worry about it. So the, the Bible itself, though, and the books within it span a broad range of, of genres and, and topics. Um, and that's why you'll probably find, if, if you've read it yourself, or, or if you talk to people who've read it, um, they'll have a particular favorite book, perhaps, one that resonates with them at, at, at a particular point in their life, or maybe a character within it that they can relate to and see, yeah, I'm a bit like that person. And the more you read it, the more, as you go through life, you can see how your life sort of mimics some of these books and some of these characters. The ones we're going to look at tonight, um, when I was in school, probably wouldn't have fallen into to my favorite subjects, I must admit. It's different now I'm older. But we'll be looking at some that just tell us about history, the, 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 the real events that really happened, uh, the books of Ruth and Esther. And then we'll be looking at what um, um, the Bible calls, or, or people call, the, the poetic books. I, I always thought a poem had to rhyme in order to be a poem, um, and I'm yet to find a rhyming verse in any of these. But nevertheless, it's, it's more complicated poetry than I would write. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. <laughs> and if you put them together, there's more than 250 chapters between them, and, and that's a lot to cover in an evening. And it might be it's the very first time we've, we've read some of those or, or, or heard the name of those books, um, let alone read through them. But um, we're going we're gonna to get through them all tonight in, in some form or other. And normally when you pick up a book to read, something off your shelf like Harry Potter maybe, a historical book, you can get an idea of the story by flicking it over and reading what's on the back cover of it. Um, and you'll be given a quick summary of what's going on and perhaps some of the main characters. And then you can turn it back over again and, and you can read through that book and you're not completely lost because you, 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 you sort of know the thread that runs through it. You've read that back cover and, and now you know you can approach that book with a bit more of an understanding. It gives you a frame to, to, to sort of reference as you read through it. And I'm going to suggest to you that if you're approaching any of these books that are up there, in fact, any book of the Bible, for the first time, that method is a good way of preparing yourself for, for, for then settling down in a nice comfy chair or however you do it with a nice cup of tea and then reading the whole thing really carefully. You want to know a, a quick overview first of all so you've got some idea of what is going to come next. And so I want to share with you a couple of, 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 of slides here, or a couple of links, that, that make this job a little bit easier. Okay, so some people like to, to, to learn by reading things on a page. There's this great book, 66 Books of the Bible. Um, that is, it's a Christadelphian book, so, so we are Christadelphians. It, it's, it's written by someone who is a Christadelphian. If you follow that look, link there at the bottom, you can get that on your phone, you can get that on your computer, wherever you want, and it'll just give um, a sort of 
one-page summary of every single book of the Bible, like the back cover <coughs> summary, if you like. A really good way of, of getting prepared for doing some deeper reading yourself. I'm more of a, a visual learner myself. I, I Probably because I'm lazy and uh, I can watch it on the screen instead of having to read it for myself. There's another link there. There's, there's loads of, of videos on the internet. Seven or eight minutes each one. You pick a book. You want to know just the, the bare bones about a book. You can go to that site, for example, hit play, and within seven or eight minutes, you've got a pretty good idea of what's going to happen if you pick up that book and read it for yourself. Now, I say that, but ultimately, of course, that there's no substitute for picking up your Bible and, and reading it for yourself. It, at some point, if you really want to understand what the message of the Bible is, how, how it affects your life, what you need to do about it, you have to pick up the actual Bible and read it. As you may know, um, we call it uh, the Bible and, and sort of consider it as one book. It's actually made up of 66 individual books. It's, it's written by all sorts of different people, um, all sorts of different time periods. But ultimately, it's written by one person. We read that in, in, in Timothy, really. God wrote it. He caused individual characters to write their individual books. But ultimately, the whole thing came from God's mind, if you like. He is the author of the whole of the Bible. And as such, you won't be surprised that wherever we look in the Bible then, it's got a consistent message. It doesn't matter who wrote it, Ruth or Samuel or David, they, they don't have different messages about life and about what's going to ultimately happen uh, 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 in the future. They've all got a consistent message. Now, if you turn to the, to the back cover of, of the Bible you've brought with you this evening, just flick it over. Um, if it's like mine, and fortunately it's, it's blank apart from a couple of numbers down the bottom there. So that, that doesn't really help us get a summary of what the Bible is about. But fear not. If we were to summarize it, it would be something like this. This is in Acts 8 verse 12. We'll, we'll be turning up plenty. Let, We'll not turn this one up for now, but if we were looking for a back cover summary of the Bible, one short sentence, it would be something like this. It's talking about a man called Philip preaching to, to, to some people. He says, when they believed Philip preaching good tidings, so the Bible, whichever book we're looking at, it's all about the good news concerning two things, the kingdom of God, and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. So whatever book we look at in the Bible, each one has a consistent message to us concerning the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can read any book with those two ideas in our mind and we can come away with, with, with a better understanding of those. In fact, Jesus himself said, as he was talking to, to some people, as he walked along a road with them when he was resurrected, they were having a chat there and he said, these are my words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, how that all things must needs be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses, i.e. the first five books, the prophets, any of the prophetic books, and the Psalms, or the, the, the poetry books, concerning me. Then opened he their mind that they might understand the scriptures. So again, he was talking about the Old Testament, because the New Testament hadn't been written then. But Jesus was saying, you can look in any of these books. You can look in the law, you can look in the prophets, you can look in the Psalms, and you'll see things that are about me. Everything is pointing forward to Jesus, as Acts says, and or pointing towards the kingdom of God that is coming. 
So, seven books to cover this evening. I'm going to give you a short pricey of each one. Keep in your mind this one, really. How does this talk in some form about the kingdom of God or the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Um, and we'll be turning up a couple of verses, perhaps, just to show how each book does that, how it ties in with the overall theme of the Bible. And then, I'm, I'm afraid, it, it really is up to you if you want to, to, to sort of do a deep dive into any of these books, you're going to have to sit in, in the comfort of your own home and have a good read through every one of those 250 chapters. And it will be well worth it, let me tell you. So the first book we're going to look at is the book of Ruth. Let's, let's turn there. Um, if you've got this red Bible, it's page... 388, 388. In fact, in the Bible I have in front of me, it, it has a short uh, praise of this book, actually, which is handy. Perhaps I'll just read that. <laughs> I won't. Okay, so... We're starting with Ruth, and for each book that we go through, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put this up. We're, we're not necessarily going to read everything I've put up there, but it sort of tries to list the main theme of the book, who wrote it, when it was written, the main characters, a key lesson, there's often more than one, and the same with a key verse, there's often more than one of those as well. So, like I said, this is one of two historical books, Ruth and Esther, that we'll be looking at tonight. So. These things actually happened. They're not um, you know, a made-up story or parable or something like that. They actually happened many thousands of years ago. And yet we can read them today, and we can still see a lesson for us in them. So God, in, in his wisdom, let those things happen in history, but then said, I want those recorded so everybody else that comes after this can read about them and can learn and, and apply the lessons in their own lives. A timeless lesson. So, hopefully we're there now in our Bibles, num uh, page number 388. Um, the main theme of this book uh, talks about redemption and the beginning of, of, of the, 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 the genealogy of Christ, if you like. Now, without getting too hypothetical, um, if this book hadn't happened, then Jesus wouldn't have been born. Of course, there'd have been another way, but all things being equal, we can say if this book hadn't happened, Jesus wouldn't have been born. So it's a very important book. Redemption, that's probably not a word we use much nowadays. Um, that means basically someone has paid money on your behalf, to, to, to get something back from you, or to get you back from somebody else, perhaps. We'll, we'll see why that's relevant in a, in a second. Okay, so a very quick summary, one or two minutes. It's basically a story that starts with tragedy and ends with, with you know, triumph and, and joy. It, it's a lovely little self-contained story in that way. And it begins, obviously, in, in chapter one, we find how um, this family have, had been forced to move away from the land of Israel down into the land of Moab and, and how that uh, all the males of, of that family died, only the females were left. And one of the main characters, Naomi, the mother of Ruth, decides she's got to get back to her own country, actually. So she decides to go and she says to her two daughters-in-law, look, you, you know, you, you can either come or you can go. I, I'd, act, I'd probably say you, you should stay here. You've got a nice settled life here. But Ruth, the main character of the book, pipes up and says, in fact, it's so, so important, really, we're going to read it from verse 16 of Ruth, chapter 1. Verse 16, Ruth says, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you, for wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. 
your God, my God, where you die, I will die, there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me and you. So an incredible act of, of faithfulness from Ruth. She chooses to associate herself with God and, and Naomi's God to return with her, not knowing what was going to happen. And, and she says, Do you know, it's so important to me, your God and the things you've told me about him. I'm definitely coming with you. So chapter two, they find themselves back in the land. They're struggling for food. It's not easy going. Um, but Ruth happens to find herself in somebody's field. The man's name was Boaz. And he notices this girl, Ruth. Now, he's a relative of Naomi. And so Naomi and Ruth hatch a plan in chapter three to, to, to get this man called Boaz to notice her and who knows, maybe sort of take her under his wing and, 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 and help out the family in this dire situation. So Ruth asks Boaz, he says, redeem my family. Save me from the situation that I'm in. And he says, I'll do that. So chapter four ends from tragedy to, to, to triumph and joy, if you like. Boaz marries this Moabite girl, Ruth, who'd given up everything to, to come back to Israel and be associated with God. And, and from those two people came the Lord Jesus Christ, eventually. So how does that sort of relate to, to the overall theme, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it so happens that the Lord Jesus Christ has redeemed, has paid something to save us. This story that took place here is actually just showing us what Jesus has done for us. Let's turn up a couple of chapters. First Peter 1 verse 18. Uh, give me a second. I haven't written this one down. First Peter 1 going to be page 1737. So our overall theme, the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to see how Christ has redeemed us, bought us in some way. First Peter 1 verse 18 and 19 says, it's talking to us in effect, Knowing that you were not, yet you were redeemed, not with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain manner of life handed down from your fathers. So we've been bought with something, the author is saying, but not silver or gold, not money. In fact, something far more valuable. But with the precious blood, it goes on to say, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, even the blood of Christ. So we're to stop and think there and, and, and we're to say, well, is this a good thing? How does this affect me? Someone's not paid a couple of pounds in order for me to be saved. Jesus Christ has given his whole life so that I, you and I, can be redeemed. One more verse, no need, no need to turn this one up, we'll just put it in on the screen there. So we've seen how, how it relates to, to Jesus Christ. We can also see how it relates to the, the kingdom of God. That's something that's coming to the earth, that's going to last forever. And Isaiah 51 tells us the ransom, the redeemed, those who have been bought by Jesus Christ, shall return and come with singing unto Zion, an everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. So in the book of Ruth, she was happy. For a while, she still died at the end of her life. But we can have everlasting joy forever and ever in the kingdom of God. Okay, let's keep moving to the book of Ruth. Um, we've got to jump a fair distance in our Bibles here to page 716, 716.
page 716. The theme of this book is, is really looking at God's care of his people. It's got a a couple of main characters, really, again, not, not too complicated, really. There's the king, Ahasuerus, who makes these, some decisions. Esther, who's a good person. Mordecai, who's a goodie. And Haman, who's a baddie. And, and the book sort of talks about um, how these, 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 these people interact and, and how, um, well, I won't spoil it for you. We'll have a look in a second. But you've got to read this book, the book of Esther, um, or you don't have to, but it's helpful to read it with, with a sort of, in the back of your mind, saying, it so happened, okay? Now, God isn't mentioned at all in the book of Esther. That's part of the point of it, in fact. But there's so many, what we would call, coincidences that, that are happening. It so happened that this person was in the right place at the right time, or that person was in the right place at the right time. So... If you read it fully for yourself, you'd see hundreds or tens of them. So it begins in Persia, again, not in the book of, uh, not in the land of Israel. It begins in Persia. Um, the king is having a banquet and, and his wife disobeys him. Um, almost unheard of nowadays. And so he disposes his wife. He gets rid of her and says, right, I want a different wife who's going to obey me this time. And so he sets out to find a new queen. And it so happens that this beautiful girl, Esther, a, a Jewess from, from, from another country, obviously, um, was there and, and caught her eye. And, and it so happened that Mordecai, her uncle, was um, known to the king and, and knew about all of this beauty pageant that would happen. And so Esther was chosen as, as the new queen and, and things looked great. But... In came the bad man, Haman. So happened, he liked everybody to bow down to him when he walked down the street. I mean, I can sort of see where he comes from. Um, I've not tried it myself, but, uh, you know, it must have been a nice feeling. And then he sees this guy, Mordecai, not bowing down to him, because Mordecai was a Jew and, and wouldn't bow down to, to this bad man. And he's, he's really angry with him. He says, right, somehow... I'm going to have to kill all the Jews. So he goes to the king, and the king's like, sounds like a good idea to me. And so they're allowed to kill all of the Jews. But it so happens he couldn't sleep that night. Um, and so he reads in, in, in his little book of, of history that Mordecai, the goody in this character, had once saved his life. And so... He says to Haman, the bad man, how do we reward this person who saved my life? And Haman's thinking it's him, and so he says all these wonderful things, and they all happen to Mordecai. Esther then tells the king that she's a Jew and that Haman has plotted all these nasty things against her. And the king sort of does an about turn and says, well, kind of my beautiful new queen destroyed. And, and so he rescues the day and, and says the Jews are allowed to fight back. So there's all sorts of coincidences going on in the book of Esther. Like I say, that, that's the, the point of the book. Though. We're supposed to look at it and we're supposed to think, actually, there's someone controlling all of these events. He's not mentioned. God isn't mentioned. But somebody's in charge of all these things that could have gone on at any time in any place and has made sure that his people ultimately get out of this tricky situation. The key verse, let's have a look at it. Esther 4, verse 14. Esther 4, verse 14. It's, it's, it's something we call... Providence. Um, I try to sort of put that in, in a different word. Protective care. The, the providence of God in people's lives. <laughs> his care in people's lives, even when we can't see it. Mordecai says to, to Esther, because she, she couldn't really see it at this time, if you remain completely silent at this time, 
the Jewish people, basically, might not be saved, but God will bring somebody from a different place to do it. Who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And in fact, she had. God had made sure she was in the right place at the right time in order to save his people. Okay, so how, how does that fit into our, to our overall theme? The things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is um, slightly more, more, more obtuse, if you like. So we'll read it, and, and then perhaps I'll try and explain it. Romans 8, verse 28 says, We know that to those who love God, everything works together for good. To those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also foreordained to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So let, let's try and pick that apart a little. So in our lives, when we wonder, um, you know, why, why are these things happening to me, perhaps? You know, I, I try and serve God, but bad things are happening to me. We can be assured all things work together for good. Even if they aren't appearing good at the time, at some point in the future, we'll be able to look back and say, well, actually, I can see God's plan now. I couldn't see it right at the time. I can see it now. And what he wants us to be, that verse continues, is to be conformed or to be like the image of his son. So as we're reading through the Bible, as we read about Jesus in particular, everything that happens in our lives is to make us more like Jesus. Okay, let's go on to the poetic book. So plenty to cover. They cover a lot of chapters here. Um, slightly easier to find in our Bibles once we've found Job, because they all run in order. Let's quickly whip through those. Page 728. The Book of Job, 728. And this is basically a story um, between Job and, and his friends. It's a, it's a very long book, really. Um, but it's a, it's a back and forth as they question and, and try to answer each other over the course of, of, of the whole of the book. Now, Job, it so happened, was a righteous man. So if we read verse 1 of the first chapter of Job, it tells us that the great man... But, more importantly, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. So he sounds like a, a, um, a good sort of guy, doesn't he? The sort of guy that good things should happen to. Because he, he fears God. He's, you know, no one can, can, can hold anything against him. He's done everything right in his life. But the book of Job then goes on to show how this man had to suffer incredible persecutions, as it were. He lost his family, he lost his, um, his homes, his cattle, he lost his health. And so we're, we're trying to ask the question, well, this man's supposed to be a good man, Job, but he's suffering terrible things. Is God just? You know, is life just random, or is there a purpose behind suffering, even if we don't necessarily understand it? Well, as we read through the book of Job, we um, find that, that, that the three friends were, were saying to Job, well, you, you, do you know, you must have done something bad, because you're, you're suffering, and only sinners suffer. Uh, Job wasn't, wasn't taking any of that on board. Um, and said, well, I've done nothing worthy of, of all of the things that are happening to me in life. Why is it happening to me? But we reach the end of the book, and we actually see that God is just. He is a kind and a loving God. We might not understand why we suffer, but at the end of it, Job is actually blessed 
far more than he was at the start. So God has taken him through this process of suffering, trying to understand his suffering. At the end of the book of Job, he's blessed more than he could have imagined. Let's turn to, to James chapter 5, verse 11. So I've got the page here, 1734. It's a bit trickier to find than some of the others we've been to. Because this sort of summarizes for us, well, the point of, of, of the book of Job and, and what we're to take from it when we're just thinking about how does this relate to, to me? How does it relate to the kingdom of God? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, 1734, if you're there. If not, I'll put it up on the board. James says, Be patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. So, the kingdom of God is coming, he says. Behold, we call them blessed which endure. The life isn't going to be easy just because you believe in God and his coming kingdom. In fact, you've heard of the patience of Job, what he had to suffer, he says. But you've seen the end of the Lord, how that the Lord is full of, percy, uh, full of pity and merciful. So the kingdom of God is coming. You're suffering in, in this life, just like Job did, to prepare you for that kingdom. A couple more verses there that, that sort of tie Christ into it as well. For here unto you were ye called, of all men now, who, who, who didn't deserve to suffer in, 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 <laughs> yeah, in a sense that he'd done nothing wrong. If we'd pick anybody out, it would be Christ, wouldn't it? Why did that man suffer? He certainly didn't deserve to suffer, we'd say. Here unto we called. Because Christ also suffered, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. And the God of all grace, who called you unto his eternal glory in Christ. So again, there's something coming which is eternal. But we've got to go through something first. After you have suffered a little while, shall make himself perfect, establish and strengthen you. So as we read through the book of Job, we try to understand suffering, but then we recognize that it's to perfect us, to prepare us for the kingdom of God, that even Jesus Christ himself suffered. Okay, on to the psalm. Now, the psalms is a very big book, 150 chapters. I don't, I don't know if you remember, or I don't know if they still do it, but sometimes when you went to, um, you know, you stay in a hotel or whatever, and you open the drawer, there's sometimes a Bible in the drawer. I think it's a Gideon's Bible. And they used to do it back, back in the day. You could look there and, and they'd say, um, you know, are you angry? Are you sad? Are you happy? Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, all, all these different feelings that we could think in life. And against each one of them, they'd, they'd show a psalm that you could go to to help you out um, in that situation. So it covers basically everything, whether we're rejoicing, whether we're, we're wanting to praise God, whether we're sad, and so on and so forth. But the tone of it is set in just the first two chapters. So let's turn it up. Um, I don't know if you've lost your page there, but it's page 778. And this sort of, like I say, sets the scene for, for the whole of, of the rest of it that follows. And it's basically saying, um, what's the difference between someone who's righteous and someone who's unrighteous? And then it tells us about the coming kingdom of God. So Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. So 
right at the start of the psalm, it's telling us, delight in God's word. And then in Psalm 2, it gives us a quick picture of the kingdom, of Jesus Christ reigning, and of everybody bowing down to him. And then the rest of the psalms there then, then give us different aspects of that. It's fairly easy in the book of Psalms to find how it relates to our central theme, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we'll just look at this one in Psalm 22, please. Psalm 22 doesn't just tell us about his sufferings, though this one is about his sufferings. It also tells us about his, his, his resurrection and, and, and is, is far more positive in that sense. But this one you, you probably recognize from, from Christ's crucifixion, basically. He'd, he'd have read all of these Psalms. He'd have seen himself in them and things like, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. I may tell all my bones. They look, they stare upon me. And then very famously, they part my garments among them. And upon my vesture, they cast lots. So we can see Christ through the Psalms time and time again. Let's keep moving. Um, you can find out more about him. Uh, in your own time, but we're, we're running out of time a bit. Let's go to Proverbs, page 911. 911, Proverbs. And these are basically short, sharp um, sayings, sentences, that, that we can use to help us to live our lives better before God. So, you know, Proverbs... Behind every silver lining, there's a cloud. You'd recognize that. Too many cooks spoil the broth. Those are sort of proverbs. Um, but the ones in the Bible, of course, are, are far deeper than that. So let's look up one of my favorite, just to orientate ourselves. It's in Proverbs 17, verse 28. So this is just to give you an idea of, of sort of, it's practical advice that can help you in, in your life. And so... When I'm sitting in meetings at work and, and pretending I know what they're talking about, um, this is one that I apply. It says, even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered per perceptive. So if you ever find yourself in a situation where you haven't got a clue what's going on, uh, just keep your mouth shut and everyone will think, ah, what a wise person they are. So, okay. That, that, <laughs> That's a practical, um, yeah, a, pra a practical way we can apply the Proverbs. Um, written by Solomon, mostly. There's over 800 Proverbs. And there's a, a picture in Proverbs 31, which, which sort of summarizes the, the whole of them. It's, it's a picture of a virtuous woman. And, and you find her in that chapter, you know, doing all sorts of of useful practical things so if somebody was to apply all these proverbs in their lives it would basically be like chapter 31 of the book of proverbs but as you read through it you'll you'll notice certainly the early chapters it sounds like a father is talking to his son and he's saying if you really want to get on in life if, if you really want godly wisdom you need to listen to what I'm going to say. I can't remember many of the Proverbs, let alone apply them, I will admit. But there was somebody who could remember every single one of them and, and, and apply them in his life. And that was the, the Lord Jesus Christ. But I just want to draw your attention to this point, because... There's different types of wisdom in the world. There's God's wisdom and there's man's wisdom. And the book of Proverbs is obviously God's wisdom. And we've got to be careful when we're talking about being wise. 1 Corinthians 3 tells us the wisdom of this world, so what people around us think is, is real good advice, is actually foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their craftiness. So if we really want to be wise 
before God, we need to be reading God's word. And the person who did that the best, the Lord Jesus Christ. It says the child Jesus grew and waxed strong, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Every day, Jesus would, would, would get up early, be reading his Bible, as it were, uh, praying to God, trying to get this wisdom into his life, which he managed perfectly. Okay, two more to go. Ecclesiastes, the next book, um, is just over the page, in, in page 957. Solomon's been pretty busy this evening. Here's another of his books. Um, and this is written really, we think, towards the end of his life. So he's, he's done everything he, he can do, assessed it, and then he's written this book of Ecclesiastes. And what's his conclusion? It's verse 2 of chapter 1. Bearing in mind, he's, he's tried everything you can try, okay? All the, 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 the fancy things in life, he's done them. And he says at the end of his life, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. The word vanity means, means it, it's, it's like vapor, it's like smoke. And, and that's, that's used 38 times in this book. So he's saying, you can do everything you like in life. You can try and... Uh, Try and get happiness and, 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 and so on and so forth from the things that you're doing. Ultimately, try to grasp it and it will be like vapor. It will just disappear. You can never get satisfaction if you're trying to live your life away from God. It's just complete vanity. His conclusion, what we should do, let's turn it up. It's in Ecclesiastes 12. Verses 13 and 14. By the end of his life, he's realized, whatever I'm trying to do to get satisfaction isn't working here when I'm not considering God in my life. However, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14, he says. So what's the, the conclusion of, of the whole of this matter, the whole of my life, in effect? Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So when we read through Ecclesiastes, we've got to try and apply what we're reading in our lives, godly wisdom. Ultimately, Solomon says, vanity, everything in life is vanity. Just fear God. Keep his commandments. This is all that he wants for you, from you. Um, just one verse then. How, how does that fit in to, to our theme, the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? And it's a bit of a, 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 an example of people who've lived their life like that. People who could have had, in many cases, anything they wanted in life. And yet they've said, do you know what? I'm not interested in anything this life can give me. All I'm interested in is fearing God and keeping his commandments. We won't turn this one up. It's, it's, it's on, the, on, the, on the screen there. It's talking about tens of faithful people in Hebrews chapter 11 who had their eyes on the kingdom of God. Like I say, many of them could have had anything in this life. These all died in faith, it tells us, not having received the promises, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, having said that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They were like, we don't want anything out of this. For they that say such things make it manifest that they are seeking after a country of their own. And indeed, if they'd been mindful of the country from which they went, they could have had opportunity to return. So if they were concentrating on this life, it would have distracted them and they'd have gone back to it. But they didn't. So what's the conclusion? God is not ashamed of those people. He's pleased for them, pleased to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And of course, that'll happen in the future, 
in the kingdom of God, when he raises these faithful people from the dead. The last book, the Song of Solomon. Well, this is a tricky book, no doubt about that. Um, it's named Song of Songs, basically uh, is a way of expressing that it's the greatest song. This is the best song, the Song of Songs. It's a collection of, of, of love poems, really, between a man and a, a woman, and, and there's some backup for, for the woman to, to, to help her understand what she needs to do. Um, if you're reading through it, you perhaps don't want to take it too literally. Um, so, not quite sure what, what the woman thought, but her, 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 her male companion compared her hair, for example, to a flock of goats, which might have been a compliment then, but probably isn't now. Um, but it's ultimately speaking to us about a man and a woman live each other, uh, love each other rather, and are preparing to get married to each other. And points forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, who would be the man in this scenario, and the woman who would be us preparing ourselves to be married to Jesus Christ. So it transports what's a, a lovely physical relationship, the, the love of a man and a woman, and transports that to a time when Jesus will be marrying his, his people, we call them several things, you know, his church perhaps, his ecclesia, the people that believe in him, a group of people marrying Christ, as it were. That's summarized in, in Revelation 19. Things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says there, this obviously hasn't happened yet, we're hoping it happens soon. Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigneth. Let us rejoice and be exceeding glad. Let us give the glory unto him. For the marriage of the Lamb, Jesus, is come, and his wife, that's us, hath made herself ready. It was given unto her that she should array herself in fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteousness, righteous acts of the saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are bidden to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So that's what we have to look forward to in the kingdom of God. The book of the Song of Solomon, the man representing the Lord Jesus Christ, how he's going to return, how he's going to, 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 to gather us together into his kingdom. So hopefully that's a flavor of, of those books that, that we've seen this evening and Maybe you, you, you can pick one you really want to dig into yourself, that, that tickles your fancy. But we as Christadelphians, as hopefully we've emphasized this evening, believe that very soon Jesus will be returning to set up his kingdom on this earth. So as you're reading through those books, you, you've got to ask yourself a couple of questions, really. How does God's consistent message. How do I see God's consistent message in these books, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Lord Jesus Christ? But perhaps more importantly, what do I need to do about it? How do I make sure that when he does return, I can be part of that kingdom of God? Now, there's plenty to say on that topic, which will be covered in, in other lectures, no doubt. But I'll just leave you with what we looked at as our opening verse, actually. And you can draw your, your own conclusions from that. But when they believed Philip, preaching good tidings concerning the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So all the best as you read those books or any other book of the Bible. And uh, we're always here to help you and guide you through them if you need help with that. Thank you, Jeremy. On your behalf, thanks to Tom for taking us through those, uh, those books and giving us that sort of way in which we can approach the whole of the Bible, looking for the things concerning the kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And 
Tom, throughout the, uh, the talk, kept challenging us to uh, dive in, to read the Bible. Uh, and at the end there, said, you know, if you want any help in that, then uh, please shout. Uh, we enjoy reading our Bibles together and learning all the time from it concerning the kingdom of God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, to help with that, we have a, a Bible reading group, which is on Wednesday mornings here at the hall, if you'd like to join that. Uh, please let us know. I've also got a couple of other uh, Bible talks coming up um, on Tuesday here in the hall at 7.30. Uh, we're looking at a particular subject, uh, a sacrifice, uh, the red heifer, uh, and we've got uh, Stephen Mellows coming to talk to us about that. And then the other invitation is that next Saturday morning, we are considering the question, are we ready for the second coming of Christ? So that's here in the hall. Um, be here for 10.30 for teas, coffees, Welsh cakes, uh, and then the, uh, the talk will be given by Isaac Brown at 11 o'clock. So we'll conclude our meeting this evening with a prayer after we've sung hymn 183. So remain standing after we've sung this hymn and we will say a prayer. Hymn 183, inspirer of the ancient seers who wrote from thee the sacred page, a light for all succeeding years, a lamp in this degenerate age. Hymn 183. Almighty God, we come before you at the end of our meeting together to thank you for the time that we've been able to spend here, that we've been able to open your word and consider 
some of the writings from it. We have considered how we should always, throughout your word, look for the things concerning your kingdom, the kingdom that you have promised upon this earth, and the things concerning your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So help us to go from this place, encouraged to read your word and to learn from it. We're told that it is the way in which we can be strengthened in our faith, that faith comes by hearing and hearing from your word. So help us to apply these things and to try always to search out your wisdom and your understanding. So please be with us as we go from this place. Please bring your kingdom soon and establish the earth, a place that will be filled with your glory through the return of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Please hear our prayer for his sake. Amen.